Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. This is part three of my ride with Stefan Baer, uh, traffic advisor for the city of Harlem in the Netherlands. He was in town and wanted to see some of the Dutch inspired uh, cycle network that has been evolving over the past decade here in the city of Austin. We're making our way up to the Mueller neighborhood where we can look at some uh, new build of the actual cycle facilities in a community that has been built from the ground up it used to be our old airport. So let's get back to it with Stefan. So if we look ahead, you can sort of see in the distance some taller buildings. That's our oh, destination. That's our promised land. The Miller or Mueller community, the old airport, and that's where we're headed. And then this street that we're on here is has been transformed into a bicycle boulevard, bikeway, bike priority route, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I would just call it a residential street, right? It's a residential street. With some yeah. bike through traffic. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. And what, we, what you'll see here is again, a couple of different levels of, of traffic calming yeah. facilities and not much else. Yeah, and, and that's also okay. So something I try to explain to people about Dutch cycle streets is that it's not a legal road category. So. Right. All a Dutch cycle street is, it's a residential street. It has the same laws that apply to it, but they, they have simply tried to lower the local traffic further, and then they have made it a convenient through route for bicycles, that's it. And the, so even if a street looks like shit, but it has a lot of through bikes on it, it's still technically a cycle street. Right. So, oh, good timing. There we go. Uh, well played. Yeah. So, so yeah, if I, if I were to see lots of bicycles using this route, and if I could maybe got a better peek at Google Street, I might even call this a cycle street, for instance, by the Dutch definition at right. least. Yeah. yeah. Or I, I think the word here is bike boulevard. Yeah. In North America, they uh, have a whole bunch of different terminology they use. But as you can tell, as we get further into here, the uh, stress level goes down. Exactly. It's super, super chill. Yep. You've got nice tree canopy. Yeah. And this is a great example of that inverted pyramid where solve problems at the highest level possible. So first land use, second network planning. Yeah. We don't need bike infrastructure here because Austin has done a great job with the network planning here, making this not a through route for cars. Right. So it's so comfortable that we can use the entire street width and we're fine. And as you see right here, we've got a pinch point, which literally is codifying that. Yes. So, so you can, uh, I think what Austin's doing a great job of showing is you can make a big difference with just a little bit. What's oh, that? hey, they, they did the parklets here. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. I'd love to call this out yeah. because instead of having asphalt run the entire way for parking and then making your road so wide where it's very comfortable to speed, just use the opportunity to make a wider sidewalk yeah. and then figure out, okay, how many cars are parking here, provide that many spaces and parklets, yeah. you get safer traffic behavior, you get a wider sidewalk, everybody wins. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, let's uh, roll straight through this. Yeah. When we come back, we'll come back down that street. This is a fun little complicated little intersection here. But as you can tell, I mean, we haven't seen a single car the whole time rolling down the street. Uh, you jinxed it. So, you jinxed <laughs> now it. I jinxed it, but it's okay. It's, it, this car is doing what we expect exactly. the, the driver to do, which is go slowly. Yeah. Activity assets all around. We've got a tennis club over here, bar, a nice park just outside of the, the Miller development. Uh, you can even feel that it's cooler here because you don't have so much pavement here. Yeah. Feel this breeze. The grass fantastic. Love it. Just love to see it. Uh, we're going to take the pedestrian crossing. Oh, in fact, they have codified this it. This is a massive road. Yep. <laughs> 
Yes. This is one of the streets where if you don't take it now, you're going to be waiting there okay. another five minutes. <laughs> All right, I'll, we'll take our chance. Yeah, to your point, um, so, this is one of the corridors that is going to be completely redesigned yeah. for obvious reasons. Yeah. It's a Strode disaster right now. 100%. And it's a financial disaster because yeah. if you, you can very quickly calculate this, the bottleneck is the intersection, and the intersection, even an intersection that's four or five lanes wide, will tap out quicker than a single lane that's in free flow conditions. Yeah. So that second extra lane departing the intersection is doing nothing. Yeah. And the city is tripling its paving costs yeah. to accomplish nothing. Right. And it's only making it harder to cycle and it's making dangerous driving behavior easier. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so what's one of the easiest things to do is simply don't rebuild lanes that aren't giving you anything extra. Right. Which, of course, as we know, is easier said than done. Yes, that's true. Especially on a strode like that, where if you even hint at doing anything, yeah. you think it's the end of the world. Yeah. By the way, just take, take all this in. We're okay. once again in. Feels like we're in a new downtown. Yeah, yeah. The new oh, really? Miller downtown. <laughs> we're actually going to be pulling off here at this uh, brew pub. So we just rolled so, in. So welcome to our neighborhood. Thank you. We got 711 acres. I don't know what that is in hectares. But I don't know either. Uh, it's a lot. But it's a lot. Uh, 16,000 people, 16,000 jobs. And then we have 37 different places you can get food. <laughs> That's so, a very American friendly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Got to so make it convenient uh, to get food. It's really an amazing community. And it's all bike and pet friendly. We've got we've got places where two-way bikeways cross, which is maybe the first place in Texas where that happens. Yeah, <laughs> I'll take them down to that intersection yeah, okay. too. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's over near where we live. Yeah, if you can do it in Texas, you can do it anywhere, you right? Can do it in, yeah, and that's what John keeps talking about is what's happened here at Bell. Yeah. And part of it was that you know we took we took staff from the city and shot them over to the Netherlands. Hmm. And said, Gad, pay attention over there, will you? Take some nuts. They came back and said, it, I can remember him saying, he says, you know, we saw this stuff going on over there. Why can't we do it here? And the answer is, we can. Yes. So he'll show you at that intersection, that's where it started. It was over there. There. It, we had already started the neighborhood, and it was wrong. And they're coming back and re retrofitting, and they're doing it right now. They're digging up the street yeah. hmm. and rebuilding it because they got it wrong the first time. Yeah. 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 We're going to ride down that section of it but, too. Okay. Yeah. But that's also, that's also the learning curve every time you have a master plan is that yeah. you have to, I think the master plan has to take into account that the knowledge isn't always there. There's going to be mistakes that are made and then the city staff are going to, be going to learn so much more and the second time around it's going to get better and better. So I think any good master plan has to be a bit flexible in the long term. And especially, is this considered the center of this Miller right here? This is center pretty much right here. Okay. Uh, the, this side is a uh, big retail center over here with things like Home Depot and Best Buy and those kind of big box stores. Mm -hmm. And But it was designed so when they go out of business, which eventually they will, right, it can be retrofitted. Fantastic. So all of the, under, the infrastructure is there to put in apartments and whatever. The skeleton's still there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the skeleton's there. So that's up there, and that was built first, so that generated the prop, the tax revenue to build the rest of them. Okay? So we are not paying for any of the streets. That's paying for all the streets. Okay? And then this is a heavily apartment complex, right? Apartment, all is good. And then it goes to single family homes, multifamily homes, that kind of stuff out there. Uh, the school, we have a school over there. Uh, we have 140 acres of park space and 700 more acres. Fantastic. Isn't that cool? <laughs> I'm really fascinated to know, uh, uh, do you know the company Urban 3? Yeah. They do that. I, I'd be really interested oh, yeah. to know what this looks like on an Urban 3 map because yeah. this must yeah, be I was, just a I was massive telling, spike. I was telling Joe that yeah. too is we yeah. need to get him back because yeah. when he did the, the data for Austin, it's years and years old. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, we need yeah. to get him back over here. I had, I had breakfast with Joe. Mm -hmm. 
one time yeah. uh, when I was doing my, when I was, used to be in that business yeah. and uh, had a great time with Joe and said, you got to pay attention, Joe. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm working with, uh, we're doing a little side project with Joe right now. We're trying to get Harlem in the Netherlands actually financially modeled to get the idea of what a Dutch city looks like wow. with financial productivity. Yes. So we're working on it right now because we have to figure out who to talk to in the city exactly, but it's a work in progress. Yeah. So what do you do? So I am a uh, transportation engineer who works for the city of Harlem in the Netherlands. So I was educated uh, in the U.S. at Sac State as a civil engineer, went into the transportation side of things kind of quickly discovered that you can't really be a transportation engineer in the U.S. because you don't have, have, the, have the education system for it. So then after two years of banging my head against the wall, I went to the Netherlands to work as an engineer over there, learned Dutch, got uh, employed by a company, and now I work for the city of Harlem, uh, okay. consulting on all the street reconstruction projects there. If you look off to the right, that's all parkland. Oh, wow, fantastic. So I'm guessing this is a really popping place to live. Like everybody wants to live here. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably quite expensive, right? Because everybody, it's a bidding war. You know? It's a bidding war now, is, yeah. is there any social housing in here? Yes, quite a bit. Two, two things, um, and, and Preston would tell you this if, if he were giving this tour, um, a certain percentage of all the houses that you will see from this point forward are, um, are affordable housing a permanent affordable housing and you can't tell because they don't look yeah. like it they look like just everything else yeah they're doing it right where it's they give people dignity also yeah yeah exactly that's great so you'll notice what we're on here which is a nice little boulevard here with a nice center area with trees and a couple of the streets where you see this treatment they were thinking that at some point in time they may run light rail down the middle of them. Oh, okay, that would have been interesting. Yeah. yeah. And then this street too. This is a more major street. Well, yeah. Go ahead and turn right on this. Okay. I was gonna say this, this feels like a proper road. In the Netherlands, this would be like that 50 kilometer an hour road where then you have the bike path yeah. parallel to it. Yeah. But hopefully in the Netherlands, you'll, you'll see fewer of those 50 kilometer roads in the urban city centers. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the, the idea is that you wanna have, a, you, like, you know, it's a debate of like, you know, if you have a certain area, right? Yeah. What's like that maximum area yeah. before you can go without interrupting it? And it's a bit nebulous. They don't have a hard number yeah. yet for that. Yeah. So I wanted to take you on this so you can see a, a good, you know, protected bike lane that's been in place for many, many years now, yeah. intersecting with a two-way cycle track. Okay. And this, we'll pull this off it. to the side here and talk about it. All right. Because this is the section that Preston was talking about. If you look at this, this right here, this is brand new. These bricks were just laid. This is all for you, Stefan. Paver See? bricks, yeah. Yeah, paver bricks, the fresh sand. It's just been put down. Um, and so this is a new treatment that is trying to bring us up to speed with what exists here. Yeah. Because this is the, the part of the community that was developed later on, years later, yes. versus this over here started out with just flex posts. Yeah. And so this is another example of they started, you can see where the flex posts are still there. Yeah. Or even better, let's take a look at what this very same intersection looked like uh, in December when I took Joshua Funches on a cycle tour of the Miller area. And you can see those flex posts. About a block or so down, and now they're coming back in and solidifying it literally in concrete and bricks. And something they got right even in the last generation is that they put in the parklet concept where instead of having it all be asphalt, they have it come out, they have you know enough for maybe six cars, yeah break it up again and that narrows down to your width perfectly and it's not even taking away any parking spaces because when they just run the asphalt through there's a huge oversupply it will never hit capacity so this is just this is cheaper for the city to do and it's just better for everybody so I'm really happy to see them even on even in the very beginning do it properly even in the very beginning and really what you're talking about here is this creates what we we, we talk about in the industry obviously is daylighting yes. you're creating a daylighting situation so you don't have a car that's right up there yes. parked that can be blocking it cool well let's roll down uh, this segment so we can see uh, the very first uh, Texas 
protected intersection where you have the intersection of two yes. two-way bi-directional uh, protected cycle tracks. Yes, yes. Pretty fun. Stop controlled, yeah. All right. Cul-de-sac gets a lot of attention and rightly so, but I think it's important for people to see even in, you know, the really car dominated you know, and the really car dominated places like Texas that you could still do good work. Yeah. And you don't have to move the um, cul-de-sac to live like to live like that. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you you mentioned cul-de-sac, um, you know, because when we think of you know, suburban kind of context in North America, that's pretty much what got built quite a bit. Yes. And that was the product that most people were like interested in because they were wanting to be on a cul-de-sac for legitimate reasons. They wanted low traffic. Yeah. But take a look to your right. Oh, that's the proper, yeah, fantastic. So there you go. Proper po pocket park. So there's a whole bunch of the development because you'll see here, all of the alleys or all the, the parking is in the alleys. And so that gives the ability to create those neighborhood, that community design where you can have that little pocket neighborhood sort of feel to it. Yeah, yeah. And I think also a, good, a really smart thing they've done here is that there's not a bunch of driveways intersecting the bicycle bicycle path. Right, so, and again, because they're all accessed from over there, the alleyways, the back alleyways. There's a lot of middle housing here, it looks like. Yes. So um, when people say there's missing middle housing, uh, we have it here. Yes. We have a little bit of everything. So here's that intersection that we were talking about. The intersection was built years before the houses went up in anticipation for this. We'll, we'll take a oh, left here. Oh, this is here. the empty lot, okay. Oh, that's the, the rest of the middle school. It's still being built. Oh, okay. Oh, and I see. That's why they want. Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but I have to, I'm just, I'm just curious. That, that's a 25 mile per hour street, correct? So, it is. you know, it's interesting. So in the Netherlands, it'd be 20, but then they wouldn't even be a protected bicycle path to begin with because it's considered low traffic. So, what are your thoughts on that? Where they, you know, a Dutch person would argue, well, if we just maybe lower the traffic volume just a little bit, this would just be a shared zone for everybody, and then that bike path wouldn't be necessary. What do you think about that? There's a big difference between 25 miles per hour and 30 kilometers per hour. Yeah. And since there's no chance in hell that this is gonna be tw uh, 30 kilometers per hour, 17 miles per hour, 15 miles per hour, then, and it's going to be 25, you might as well put in the protected infra infrastructure because for all intents and purposes, people are driving 30. Yeah. And then boom, there you go. You're right at, you're right at your 50 kilometer per hour yeah. point. So in essence, it operates yeah. like 50 kilometer per hour. So was there ever a debate where they said, we want, we want a 20 mile per hour, 30 kilometer an hour speed zone? Do you know, do you know that was part of the discussion in the very beginning? I'm sure it was, but quite honestly, that was two decades too soon for that conversation yeah. to happen in the state of Texas. We're still a decade away for that conversation to happen legitimately. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll pull up here uh, and just stop and talk, chat a little bit. Oh wow, new concrete since the last time I was here. Oh, look at that. Oh wow, this is all brand new, Stefan. This is so cool. Uh, so it's the first for you also, okay. So. All right, come, come check this out. This is exciting. So the other thing that this complex has is around the entire perimeter, around this entire property, which again, used to be the airport, used to be the municipal airport, would have been the airport that you would have flown into. Um, around this entire property is this natural surface walking trail, hiking trail. It goes all the way around. So it's a crushed, crushed granite type of thing. Confirmed, you can actually see too, because you can, you can see the dig down, you can see exactly what's there. Look back this way, it goes in that direction there too, and in this direction. So this is brand new, and it, it looks like they have just- That is kind of interesting though, that they have a sidewalk kind of next to a yep. 
a walking path. It's like, why wanted that make Natural mm. surface. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Surface. I wonder why they didn't just make it one walking path or... Interesting, interesting. They wanted to carry the natural surface trail all the way around because yeah. a lot of people prefer a natural surface. Sure. Uh, for especially runners prefer a natural surface yes. versus concrete. They yes. they try to avoid concrete at every <laughs> turn, yeah. and so uh, yeah. I can say you can say it's like a, it's that's like a walking path versus a running path. Yes. And, okay. Yes. Interesting. But interesting though too, you, because then you look at the the street design. If we come back around here, and you take a look, and you see that, yeah, you've got the the, the sidewalk and then the path, the natural surface trail, and then a street, which is pretty much just a quiet street. Yeah, it's so. Uh, and so it's a low speed environment. Yeah. Um, I'd say that with a park. Only in a place like te that has as much space as Texas could you get away with something like this. In the Netherlands, this would be the dream that you have this much space <laughs> to work yeah. with. You know, we'd, we would just be stuck with the, with the street itself, I and mean, yeah. I hope to God even that is enough. So yeah, it's. But again, you know, the the solution for everybody isn't necessarily going to be Dutch because, as I said earlier, Correct. it's going to take you 40 years to yeah. get to the depth to, yeah. to the Dutch. Yeah, level. And, and even and even then, it's going to look different. Yeah, even then. Yeah. So, well, this is cool. I, again, this wasn't done the last time I was filming here, which is a couple weeks ago. So, yeah, this is cool. Okay, let's go uh, check out a, a, a skate park and a bike park. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. When we come back, we'll be taking a look at that skate and bike park, as well as continuing our ride through the Mueller community, uh, obviously experiencing the Dutch inspired cycle network. We'll get a glimpse of the old tower, as well as the construction being done on Zach Scott Boulevard there, making our way across that nasty Strode Airport Boulevard and continuing on to the Martin Luther through King Jr. Transit Station. So until then, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.